Before I tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Shayan. Um, I want to tell you a story, a story about how I joined the gym. And um, I got one of those fancy trainers, and I asked the fancy trainer, what diet should I go on? Should I go on the keto diet, the carnivore diet? What sort of workout should I do? And he said, you know, that's the problem with people today. They're always looking for shortcuts. If you focus on the fundamentals, you'll be okay. There's no cookie cutters to life. And that had a profound impact on me because I thought about it as an entrepreneur or a human being. We're always looking for the next cool idea. We're always looking for something different. Now, TED and TED Talks are about ideas worth spreading. But I believe there are some ideas worth spreading again and again until they become contagious, until they contagiously cause inspiration. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is hope and faith what I believe to be the true key to happiness. Now, you're not going to need hope and faith on a normal day, but um, like Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. This is a picture of me in Bali with my friends. It was a great time. Um, we, I just done the pro-Pakistani deal. We were all having a great time in Bali. I was getting married in a few months. Life was amazing. And then I got a call from my sister. And she told me that my mother had fallen ill. And um, she told me that uh, she had a tumor in her brain and that we had to go back to Pakistan because she needed immediate neurosurgery followed by chemotherapy for her cancer. And I was so nervous, I didn't know what was going to happen. I took the next flight back home and I met my mother. And she was calm. She was as calm as I've ever seen her. And she said, I want to do three things so I can't you know, I need to fight this because I need to do these three things. And I asked her what they were. She said she wanted to get me married. She said she wanted to remodel the house. And she said that she wanted to fix my dad and her business. This is a picture of my wedding. She got me married. She remodeled the house. And she fixed the business as well. And we went on to have a great time. And she went into remission. 18 months later, and the cancer came back. And this time, it had spread quite badly. Um, the doctors, some of them gave her a few months. Some of them, at times when it did spread, gave her a few weeks. And this time, I was sure that she's not going to be calm. This time, I was sure she wasn't going to have hope. Because the way it had spread, the, the doctor said she had to get chemotherapy this time, radiotherapy. And if she made it through radiotherapy, she would have to get what is called a stem cell transplant. And for her condition, she would have been the first person in Pakistan to get that transplant done, and one of very few people in the world. And then started the next journey. So nights on this sofa taught me more about anything, uh, more about life than anything else I've ever experienced. They were tough, but I learned so much. I learned by looking at my mother. And one of those days, through chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and during her stem cell transplant, when she was learning how to walk again, I asked her, how do you have the will to keep going? And she replied, Tabakul, faith. I believe that my destiny is written, but I must do, but I must have hope and I must do what is in my power. My mother not only completed her chemotherapy, her radiotherapy, but she was the first person in Pakistan to complete a stem cell transplant for her very rare condition. And she's sitting right over there. There's an Italian proverb that reads, hope is the last thing ever lost. As long as you have hope, you have a chance. The next thing I want to talk to you about is purpose. If you have hope and faith, you need a purpose, a reason to wake up in the morning. The Japanese, or specifically the Okinawans in Japan, have a saying called Ikigai. What it means is a reason for being, a purpose, a reason to wake up in the morning. My father, who is also in the audience, is an entrepreneur and a great one at that. But my whole childhood, I used to wonder, how does this man keep going? He's always on a plane. He's always in a car. He's always in a meeting. It's nonstop. And I never understood it until I understood what Ikigai meant. He had found his passion. He had found his mission. He had found his profession. He had found his vocation. And once you find those things, you never work a day in your life. And the Okinawans believe there is no word for retirement, thus they have no word for retirement. And that's what I keep telling my father as well. Once you find your ikigai, you can never retire. 
Now, once you find your purpose, you're going to need a lot of courage. You're going to need the ability to take a chance. There's a beautiful quote by Michael Jordan where he talks about all the sh games he lost, all the shots he missed, all the game-winning opportunities where he couldn't deliver. This is not just true for Michael Jordan. It's true for Lionel Messi. It's true for Muhammad Ali. It's true for every entrepreneur. You are going to miss chances. It is the courage to take the next chance that really matters. Before I met my partners, Gabriel and Irina, uh, my partners in Icon7, their agency at the time, Bad Cat, was on the brink of bankruptcy. The 2008 recession had hit, things were really bad, and Irina went to Gabby and she said, you know what, the cash flows are horrible, we need to shut down. Gabby gave her five euros and he told her, why don't you go win the lottery? And in a crazy turn of events, they won the lottery. And they used that money to keep the business afloat. Now, why I'm telling you this is because input does not equal output. Sometimes you're going to try very hard and not get somewhere. And sometimes God is going to give you something perfectly gift wrapped for you. You have to keep having the courage to go forward. In 2015, they bought a ticket on a 24-year-old Pakistani kid. And I haven't won the lottery for them yet. As we continue to grow, I hope one day for my team and for Gabby and Irina that we can win the lottery. Now, people is the next thing I want to talk to you about. They say teamwork makes the dream work. Steve Jobs said once, in weak companies, culture, politics win. In strong companies, ideas do. When we started Trade More, it was horrible. Um, the first team we had in Lahore, we had to let go of them. The next team in Islamabad. It was a toxic work environment. And my partner, Tala, at the time used to always tell me that it doesn't matter if we have to take three steps back, we have to build the right culture. And he was right. It is the foundation of any successful organization. And once we were able to build that culture, once we had this amazing team that we have now, they worked together. And that togetherness is more important than education, than anything else, because they are a team. And that is what you need to succeed. Now, if you have the team, what you're going to need is perseverance, the power to keep going. I'm going to tell you about an experiment conducted in the 1960s by Stanford University. It's called the Marshmallow Experiment, and it basically took eight-year-old children and it gave them two options. Have one marshmallow now, or take 15 minutes for two. And they studied the children as they grew up. And they found that the child who was able to delay immediate gratification, the child who was able to wait, to persevere, tended to be more successful in life. Now, why this is important in today's day and age with social media and everything being instant is we forget the power of patience, the power of persistence. Steve Jobs again once said, if you look closely, every overnight success took a long time. This is a timeline of my partner Amir Atta and his story in Pro Pakistani. In 2006, just like Gabby and Irina, he tried to win the lottery. He lost. He dropped out of college. In 2008, he started a little blog called Pro Pakistani. It didn't do very well. In 2011, it nearly shut down due to cash flow issues. In fact, it wasn't until 2013 where the business actually got its first big retainer. Why that's important is because for all my association to pro-Pakistani, everyone never talks about this timeline. They talk about this timeline. The timeline from 2014 onwards, where the business began to explode, where Amir Atta became a household name. No one ever talks about the perseverance and the persistence and the journey that he went on to get there. The next thing I'm going to tell you about is personality and the importance of being you. This is me, eight years old. Ignore the Indiana Jones face. I had a teacher at the time. Her name was Miss Bother. And she called my parents to uh, a parent-teacher meeting, and she told them, I can't teach your son anymore. Your son is not normal. Your son is special. He needs to be in a special school. She said that I had a writing disorder. She said that I was, maybe I was autistic. She said that I shouldn't be in a normal school. Now, my parents panicked. They took me first to Shifa to see psychologists, then to Aga Khan, and then they took me somewhere in London, which I'm forgetting now. But 
all these psychologists, they ran multiple tests on me. It was the longest summer of my life. And uh, Ms. Badr wasn't wrong. I was special. Um, and I did have a writing disorder, but I'll get to that. She was right in that I was special because I had ADHD. But I never viewed that as a weakness. I always viewed that as a superpower. I have the ability to concentrate on a hundred different things at the same time, something other people don't have the ability to do. Now, as far as my writing disorder, this is my signature. As you can see, it's horrible. My bank calls me twice a week, and they often tell me, your signature doesn't match, we can't process the check. But I'm very lucky because I have my wife, I have my mother, and I have fantastic business partners who can sign on my behalf, so it's okay. The next story I'm going to tell you about is sixth grade, Miss Maggie. Miss Maggie was my art teacher, and after a year of drawing, I went to her for a final check, and she said, all I can do is throw this art book in the bin. I was quite sad and embarrassed. The entire class was obviously laughing at me. But Miss Maggie actually taught me something very important that day. She taught me that if you're not good at something and you want to get by in life, you're going to need to delegate and you're going to need to trust other people to do it. From then onwards, every time I had to do art, I asked a friend to do it for me. And I learned the art of delegation. Today we run a creative agency, which requires a lot of art. And I'm lucky that I have my creative director and artist wife and this beautiful team of creatives who do the art for me. And I am lucky and glad that Miss Maggie taught me that if you're not good at something, learn to let others do it for you. The next story I'm going to tell you about, and before I tell you about the story, I need to give you some context. I belong to a family of debaters, fantastic debaters. My father, my older sister, Anushe, even my younger sister, Iman. In fact, I was always the black sheep in the family and they were always the talented ones. And my brother-in-law uh, is one of the smartest people I've ever met. So one day I went to him, he's also a great debater, and I was like, why don't you write me a speech? Something that you would say. And he wrote me this incredible passage. Uh, it was like poetry. And I was like, okay, perfect. So all night I practiced it. I wanted to do my best small by impersonation. And um, I went to school the next day. I memorized all of it. I had a paper in my hand. I stood in front of the crowd. And right as I said, assalamu alaikum, I ripped the paper in half and I ran out of the class. And that lesson, I remind myself today and every day since, it always helps me remember to never pretend to be someone else. Usman bhai may be smarter than me, but I have to be me. I have to be genuine. I have to be myself. And the last story I'm going to tell you about my life is how I failed my first year of university by 1%. I was at the University of East Anglia. And I asked my brother-in-law to go with me to talk to the dean, Trevor. Trevor didn't like me very much. And um, when I went to him, I begged him. I said, please, can you please take me? Take me, it's 1%. And he said, it's not about 1% or 50%. At the University of East Anglia, we're looking for the best of the best. And then he paused and he said something that had such a profound impact on me, I can't tell you. He said, let's face it, Cheyenne, it's not like you're going to give a TED talk anytime soon. Now, this is not about proving the naysayers wrong. Okay, maybe a little bit. But what it really is about is, in life, everyone is going to have a Miss Bother. They're going to have a Miss Maggie. They're going to have a Trevor. And they're going to have themselves. So we're going to try to put them into a box and tell them what they are. You need to drown out that noise. You need to be yourself. Because there is no point in trying to be anyone else. You are going to be at your best when you are yourself. I leave you with one final thought, and it's pretty simple. If a goofy kid like me, with ADHD, a writing disorder, and stage fright, can stand on this stage before you and try and inspire you, imagine what you could do if you focused on the fundamentals and tried to live a life that means something. Thank you very much.